personal discipling relationships. One of the most biblical and valuable uses of your time as a pastor will be to cultivate personal discipling relationships in which you are regularly meeting with a few people one-on-one to do them good spiritually. Now, it just so happens that, much to my surprise, there's a book here that you can purchase about this. Um, I knew of this book's existence, but I thought it wasn't going to be out until 2010. So when Tony or Marty or somebody thrust into my hand right before this meeting a copy of The Trellis and the Vine, I was shocked and delighted. Um, They, for some reason, asked me to blurb this thing. And uh, on the back of it, I, I say, this is the best book I've read on the nature of church ministry. Uh, What am I giving my life to? Well, church ministry. What is the best book I've read on church ministry? Uh, This one. Really? The best book? What, do you just go using superlatives all the time? Uh, Maybe. But I'll use them very carefully. I mean, I'll I'll, I'll say best of, and I'll have a very defined category. Uh, This was a pretty broad category, nature of church ministry. Um, I was uh, delighted when Tony gave me this in manuscript to read a few months ago. Um, Man, they've captured what I've been trying to do for for 15 years at our church in Washington. Uh, And I would strongly encourage you to get a copy of this. Let me just give you an example. This is on page 26. Um, Imagine a reasonably solid Christian said to you after church one Sunday morning, look, I'd like to get more involved here and make a contribution but I just feel like there's nothing for me to do. I'm not on the inside. I don't get asked to be on committees or lead Bible studies. What can I do? Okay, have you ever had a conversation that remotely resembles that in your church? Just put up your hand. I'm curious. Maybe it is just me. I want, hands up higher just for a moment. I want to get an idea. It's like a poll. Do most pastors experience this? Okay, it looks like most pastors experience this. I experience this. Well, I'm really curious. They've been listening into my life. What, what should I be doing? What would you immediately think or say? Would you start thinking of some event or program about to start that they could help with? Some job that needed doing? Some ministry that they could join or support? This is how we're used to thinking about the involvement of church members in congregational life in terms of jobs and roles. Usher, Bible study leader, Sunday school teacher, treasurer, elder, musician, song leader, money counter, and so on. The implication of this way of thinking for congregation members is clear. If all the jobs and roles are taken, then there's really nothing for me to do in this church. I'm reduced to being a passenger. I'll just wait until I'm asked to do something. The implication for the pastoral staff is similar. Getting people involved and active means finding a job for them to do. In fact, the church growth gurus say that giving someone a job to do within the first six months of their joining your church is vital for them feeling like they belong. All right? So basically, Tony has been listening in to pretty much what I am being told in the books that I read. And perhaps you too have been given that advice. But then he has this very interesting expression that uh, in the original Australian is, however, (laughs) however, if the real work of God is people work, the prayerful speaking of his word by one person to another, then the jobs are never all taken. The opportunities for Christians to minister personally to others are limitless. So you could pause and reply to your friend. See that guy sitting over there on his own? That's Julie's husband. He's on the fringe of things here. In fact, I'm not really sure whether he's crossed the line yet and become a Christian. How about I introduce you to him and you arrange to have breakfast with him uh, every other week and read the Bible together? Or see that couple over there? They're both fairly recently converted and really in need of encouragement and mentoring. Why don't you and your wife have them over and get to know them and, and read and pray together once a month? And if you still have time and want to contribute some more, start praying for the people in your street and then invite them all to a barbecue at your place. That's the first step towards talking with them about the gospel or inviting them along to something. Of course, there's every chance that the person will then say, but I don't know how to do those things. I'm not sure I'd even know what to say or where to start. To which you reply, oh, that's okay. Let's start meeting together and I can train you. Now, if you're a pastor reading this book, your reaction at this point might be something like this. Okay, right. Now I really know these guys are living in a dream. In their fantasy world, I'm supposed to have time to meet individually with all the members of my congregation and personally train and mentor them so they can in turn personally minister to others. Have they seen my diary? Do they have any idea of the pressures I'm under? If that's what they mean by a mind shift, it sounds more like a brain explosion to me. Well, we haven't seen your diary, by which they mean your schedule. But if it's anything like most pastor's diaries, we know very well the pressure you're under and in due course, we'll get to the nitty-gritty of how these sorts of mind shifts play out in the day-to-day life of real churches. However, 
there is some vital biblical work to be done first. To understand the scriptural foundations for refocusing our ministries around people rather than structures, we have to go back and re-examine our core assumptions about what God is doing in our world and how He is doing it, who He is using to do it, and what it means for Christian discipleship and ministry. And that's what He goes on and explains. That's what the church is. Friends, that's an exact description of what I try to do pretty much every Sunday at our church after the service at the door. I am trying to get Christians together in ministry, in gospel ministry, in each other's lives individually. Our church is a conglomeration of that. That's what a church is. That's what the ministry is about, causing that to happen, which is far more than simply you're preaching excellent sermons. And I don't know of a better book to tell you to look at than this one, The Trellis and the Vine. It's just come out. Friends, I encourage you, if you want to think more about one-to-one -one ministry as a basic part of your pastoral ministry, of your shepherding, not just you doing it all yourself, because that's, of course, unrealistic, but you teaching your people so that they will be equipped to do that with each other, so you get this kind of wonderful domino effect running out in every direction. That's what you want your congregation to be, and this book can help to cast a vision for that and instruct you practically on how you can do that. All right? Clear? Unpaid advertisement there. I just really think this is going to help you in being able to have that kind of ministry. And you know what? That is so important. I don't even need to say anything else myself about that.